Right, so the topic, the main topic of today's lecture is cross-validation and bootstrap. So let me start with cross-validation. So again, this is a topic that some of you might be already familiar with from APS 1070, but uh, today we're going to provide sort of a statistical perspective on cross-validation. So um, as we discussed before, the capability of a machine learning model is um, uh, mainly measured in how well it makes predictions for observations it has not seen before. So this whole idea of making predictions on new data, we call it, we kind of measure it using the idea of test error. So test error here um, is not just about separating some part of the data and call it test and measuring error on that, but more as a general concept that is the main performance indicator for a machine learning model in terms of how good of predictions it can make on new data, right? So how do we find test error? So one idea, the ideal situation is having a separate data set and measuring the error there. But the thing is, as we discussed before, usually with, at least with supervised learning, um, we have data sets that are um, wide and short, meaning that n is less than p. And these are the situations where you know, our models may suffer from curse of dimensionality, uh, meaning that they cannot perform to their true potential because of lack of sufficient data. So the ideal situation is this, when we have large n compared to p, or a tall, skinny data set. So the thing is, if we want to have a separate data set just for testing, meaning that we you know, separate maybe this part out for testing, then the actual data set that is you know, accessible to us for, let's say, training and evaluation or hyperparameter tuning will be even shorter. So, so this issue of curse of dimensionality actually exacerbates here. That's why the first idea of having a totally separate data set uh, for measuring test error um, is not practical in all situations. Whenever there's sufficient data, we can always do that. And, um, but the topic of today's lecture is resampling, how we can uh, kind of recycle the same data that we have so that we get a better measurement on test error while not jeopardizing the training phase of the, of the machine learning uh, development. So that was the first idea. The second idea, so the first idea was, let's say, a separate data set for testing. The idea, this idea is attractive because it's very simple and it works, but only when we have sufficient data. The second idea is, is using training error. So with the idea of using training error, the issue is that training error is not a good approximation of test error because it's kind of cheating. We're measuring the performance on data that the, that the algorithm has already seen. So if it has you know, overfit or if it has memorized the data, then it's going to give us good performance while the actual test error, which is you know, a measure of performance on cases it has not seen before, will be, the error will be higher, right? So, so the issue with this is that training error underestimates test error. Uh, and you may remember this plot where we have MSE on y-axis and then let's say uh, model complexity or model flexibility on the x-axis. Um, and then the training error usually decreases the more of a complex model we use. Uh, but test error usually has a behavior like this. It, it decreases up to some level, which is the same thing we had before. Uh, this is the same thing as here. The suitable value for the hyperparameter or the suitable level of fit. And then if we, if we make the model more complex, the test error is going to increase because of increasing variance. So in the right side of this, we are seeing increasing variance and increasing bias to the left. What we want is a bias variance trade-off, which is here. So that's why this idea doesn't work either. Then the third idea is, let's say, Validation. So using a validation set, again, you might be already familiar with it. Um, the idea is that if um, we split the accessible data to train and validate. So each data point is either used for training or for validation, and there must be a clear distinction. So what this means is that if the data set let's say it looks like this, we're going to split it in two parts and maybe use this for training, use this for validating. So first we're going to shuffle the data, right? So they are not you know, first to 100, they are shuffled, and then maybe we use the first, let's say, 
80% or so for training, 20% for validation. This is kind of another decision we need to make about you know, how much data we need given the number of features that we have, right? So that this doesn't, this up um, rectangle doesn't become like this, right? Ideally, it, it shouldn't yet become uh, too short. So with validation, what we're going to do is to use this data for training the model, and then when the model is trained, we're going to evaluate it on, on some data it has not seen before, which is in the validation set. Yeah, it's, it's very similar to the first approach. There's one distinction here. The distinction here is that we can train the model on this, validate it on this, and using the validation set, make decision about the hyperparameter, for example, right? So let me give you an example. That after the hyperparameter is tuned, for example, we know the degree of polynomial, then we can go back and use all of this for training so that we are not wasteful. So that's the idea. So that's the distinction between this and the first idea. Uh, so let's say that we want to measure the degree of polynomial. We want to tune it, right? We don't know whether we should use a linear regression function or quadratic or cubic or degree four or whatever. So what we're going to do is first, we fit a polynomial of degree zero, which is just the average of y values, and we validate. That's going to give us some, some MSE. When d is zero, it's going to give us some MSE. Let's say it's uh, here. This is MSE of the validation set. Then we train a model with degree one, validate in here, we see that the error decreases. Maybe it becomes this. Then we train with a model, a quadratic model, validate here. From validation, we get MSE. MSE validate for D equal to two. Then we try three, validate, that gives us, let's say, something here, and so on. So, you know, we get a bunch of these. Actually, let's say, all right. So this is the pattern that we see, right? Now that we have this, we decide that this is the suitable value of the hyperparameter. Then d star is two. Now that this is chosen, we can go back and train a new model on all of this. The reason why we are doing this is that we want the model to have sufficient data, right? The model we got from training on 80% was not the best model that we could get from this accessible data because it is accessible to us. It is accessible for validation and training, right? So that's, that's the validation um, idea. Then we have another idea, which is cross-validation. And this is what we actually use in practice. Again, you might be already familiar with it from previous courses. So cross-validation um, kind of resolves a problem that validation has. So using a validation set, uh, the issue is that there's high variance um, in these measurements. So if you repeat the same process and plot another one of these, right, just a second time, the second plot may look like this. The second plot may look like this. If you try it a third time, it may look like this. So the shape is almost the same. It's kind of decreasing all the way to two and then maybe increasing or kind of stabilizing or oscillating, whatever. So. When we repeat this process, we get different results each time. There's no kind of stability of, the, um, of our approximation of the test error because MS evaluate, which is on the y-axis here, is meant to be an approximation for this. But this approximation has high variance, meaning that if you repeat it, we get a different result next time. We repeat it because the shuffling is different. Each time we repeat this process, we shuffle the data. Therefore, the data that ends up in training and data that ends up in validation would be different. You know, some data points could be just you know, very informative for training, right? and maybe very challenging for validation. If they end up in training, that makes the model stronger. If they end up in validation, um, that, kind of, um, that kind of overestimates MSE tests will be here if challenging data points or informative data points end up in validation. So this is one issue with the validation approach. Um, it kind of gives us the value of D star. This part is okay, but the issue is high variability. We have high variability over different uh, repetitions of the validation process. So if we, if we only cared about finding the hyperparameter, this method is okay. But if we want to get a good measure of test error, we need a more advanced uh, technique. And the more advanced technique is cross-validation. So cross-validation is going to take care of this and give us low variability, meaning a better estimate of the actual test error. 
So with cross-validation, this is what we're going to do. So let's say the accessible data was this, right? So we're going to split this accessible data in, let's say, three different splits. So we, we split it in three parts, right? And then we're going to start with this arrangement where this is used for, let's say, training. This one is also used for training, and this one for validating. Then in the second step, we have the same splits, but the roles of these data points are different. Now we use this for train, this one for validate, and this one for train again. As you may expect, we repeat this again. Now the first, uh, first uh, split is used for, sorry, first fold. So each of these is a fold. So this is fold one, fold two, fold three, and then this is, let's say, split one, split two, split three. So in split three, this one is going to be used for validating the other ones for training. All right, now from this, we're going to get some, we're going to get some MSE, right? And we're going to get some, let's say, D star. So this is MSE from split one. That's why I represented with MSE one. From this, we're going to get MSE of split two and some D star from split two. Again, from this, we're going to get MSE three and D star of three, right? So by using the values of MSE, now we can average them and say MSE cross validation is sum of the three MSEs over the number of splits. So if the number of splits is three, then one all the way to three and divided by three. And then we also get some standard error of of MSE CV, which is the standard deviation of, let's say, MSE I from one to three, right? Those three, we get their standard deviation. I can also write it like this. So it's, it's sum of MSE I minus MSE CV. We square this, we add them from one to three. Um, we divide them, if you're using Sample standard deviation n minus one, otherwise we divide by n, which is three, and take their square root. What I'm saying is, instead of getting one number, which was the case with validation, we get three numbers, and we get their aggregate measurements, which is average and standard deviation. Now, if we, if we plot this average, MSE cross validation on y-axis and degree of polynomial on x-axis, This is the pattern that we see. Again, we can see that the suitable choice for the hyperparameter is two, but the difference is that this plot is reliable. This plot is not going to vary a lot if we just repeat the cross-validation. When we repeat the cross-validation, the result that we get from repeating the cross-validation may look like this, very close to the previous one. When we repeat again, again, low variability. The results are not going to change that much. So you can see that here, depending on you know, how lucky or unlucky we are in terms of what ends up in training, what ends up in validation, the model becomes less capable or more capable, and our validation becomes more stringent or more lenient. Therefore, the plots would look different. Here, we are aggregating the results. Therefore, you know, those kind of variability, because of differences in, in, the, uh, in the splits, disappear, because we aggregate them and get a much better measurement of the test error. So this is called cross-validation. And actually, uh, in, in Python, Excitedlearn takes care of all of this for you. You just load the, uh, you load the library and use cross-validation. You only need to let Scikit-learn how many folds you want. So here we use three, but actually the suitable choice is five or 10. Because um, for typical situations with five folds or 10 folds, um, we can you know, uh, kind of shake up the data sufficiently so that this aggregation becomes uh, low variance. Yeah? Sorry, number of? 
Uh, I mean, there's, uh, yeah, there's really no need for that. Why, why do you think we need normal distribution? Uh, it doesn't need to follow normal distribution. Yeah, we, we're not making use of normal distribution here. Any other questions? Yeah? Great question. So let me answer it maybe here. So here on the x-axis, we are increasing flexibility or complexity. Uh, this is MSE of test. Maybe we obtained it using the very first method. You know, that was kind of luxurious. We don't always have data for that. But let's say we had a totally separate test set. So we are actually measuring test set directly, and we got this plot. So this region is underfit because the model is not complex enough or flexible enough to capture the nuances and regularities that are in the data. Uh, for example, here, we just use, when d is 0, we are just taking the average of y values and using that as prediction. So when we ask the model, what is the, what is the price of a house that is 1,000 square feet, it's going to give us some value. If we ask the model for price of a house that is 3,000 square feet, uh, it's going to give us the same value. So it's too simplistic, the model, for the fact that price of houses change based on their size. So th we are underfit. Um, I guess with 1, we are also underfit because with, with a polynomial of degree 1, the slope is fixed. We can either go up or go down. But the data goes up and down, right? Uh, therefore, this kind of, kind of nuance in the data that kind of changes sign cannot be captured with the polynomial of degree 1. So we are still underfit here. With 2, we, are, we have a suitable level of fit, as you can see here and here. But with 3, what happens is that uh, the model becomes too complex. For example, um, it, may, it may become something like this. It may go up and then here, come down here, and go up again. Because it's a polynomial of degree 3, so it can change sign two times. So it's one time, two times. Therefore, it's just too flexible. When we fit it to the, this, this data, it may end up going up at the end just because of what's happening between these two data points. And the model going up uh, doesn't seem to be a good idea. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. So that's why we are overfit here. Now in terms of bias and variance, this MSE has three components. It's, it's variance plus bias squared plus epsilon, which is irreducible error. So to the left of this, bias is, um, bias, is, bias is high, variance is low. Why variance is low? Because in the model where we just give the average of price of houses, regardless of their size, you know, that average doesn't change if we fit a different model. The mod these models don't care about size of house. They just, they just give the average. Therefore, variance is low. But bias is high because, on average, we are, kind of, we are making errors all the time. That's why bias is high. But here, with overfit, the, the opposite is the case. So bias has been reduced because now the model is not making you know, as much error on average, but variance is high. Variance is high is because model is very flexible. Therefore, um, not only it fits the data, fit to the signal, but it also fits to the noise. Therefore, if you get a different training data set and train the same model on that new training data set, it's going to be a different model because it's going to fit to the noise of the second data set. And noise of first data set and second data set are different. Uh, so here, variance is high. What we want is a bias-variance trade-off. It's kind of a compromise between bias and variance. That would be here. So in this model, bias is not 0. Variance is not 0 either. But both of them are at some moderate level that eventually minimize MSE. And there's also this component that is irreducible. We cannot do anything about it. And this means that MSE of test never reaches the x-axis. The best thing we can do is this, which means that probably this part is because of epsilon. Yep. Uh, so th this variance is kind of a complicated concept, but I can, I can try explaining it again. This variance is the variability of, um, of our models um, if we train them on different training data sets which all come from the data generation process. So in, in actual situations, we don't have a measurement of this variance because we only have one data set. But in synthetic situation, when we're trying to make sense of this kind of theoretical concept, we can simulate data right, and create different training data sets from the same simulation. And then um, the variability of a flexible model over different training data sets that are synthetically produced are going to be high. Other questions? Uh, variance in the function? You, uh, you mean in the, in the estimated function? Yeah, I would say that's not, that's not accurate because 
there's kind of two, two levels. I mean, it's, it, it's a variance, but over what? It's not a variance over the variability in one data set, because that's not necessarily something bad. That's just the nature of the data set. If a data set has you know, many ups and downs, then it has high variance. But here, high variance is something that we always want to avoid. So high variance is just means um, kind of um, uh, instability of our model over different, uh, let's say, projects, right? You have one project, you know, all of them are about some company, right? You, you train a model on the data for the you know, first, let's say, quarter of a year, and the model behaves in a certain way. And then if you train the model on, let's say, the second quarter of the year, it, it, may, be a totally different, it may give you a totally different prediction despite the fact that behavior of the overall like, customers of that company are the same between those two quarters. That would be a model that is certainly overfit because it is showing us some variability between quarter one and quarter two that is not in the nature of the customer's behavior. Therefore, it must have come from fitting to the noise. And noise between quarter one and quarter two are different because they are just random values you know, uh, that are not explained by anything, by the behavior of customer or anything. Uh, it's, uh, no, it's not even the variance of performance of the model. Uh, actually, the model may uh, is going to show us uh, is going to show us, let's say, this much performance uh, all the time. But the issue is that uh, this is some aggregate thing that comes from um, different predictions, right? Um, for the first quarter, it becomes a model that says price of this house is two thousand two million dollars. If you ask next quarter, it's going to say four million dollars, something totally different. But the thing is, as the performance is kind of an aggregate measure underestimates and overestimates kind of cancel out with each other. Therefore, we don't see the, the impact of that variability directly here. Yeah. So as I said, this variance is you know, quite an intricate concept. You know? In some other courses, we only mention bias variance trade-off. This is what it is. But if you want to really get deep and understand what this means, um, you know, it, it requires quite a bit of thinking. Yeah. So variance here is variability of a model over different training data sets, something that we pretty much um, never see in practice. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so as I said, uh, it depends whether you want to use uh, sample standard deviation or population standard deviation. The right thing to do is to use sample standard deviation, so it should be k minus 1. Um, I didn't want to really emphasize that uh, to, to um, you know, complicate the situation, but in order to be accurate here, we should use 2. Otherwise, it would be a biased uh, estimate of the standard deviation. But it's just a very, very intricate detail. Uh, you don't really need to worry about it that much. What I was trying to tell you is that instead of getting one number, which is what we get in here, right? In here, we train, we validate, we get one number. That's it. But with cross-validation, we get three numbers. Now, these three numbers are going to give us some average with low variance. Um, and we can also get a sense of the variability between these. Yeah. So there are two concepts, population standard deviation and sample standard deviation. In population standard deviation, we divide by n. In sample standard deviation, we divide by n minus 1. Uh, this is because average of a sample is not totally free from observations in the sample. There's actually n minus 1 degrees of freedom. That's why here it should be n minus 1. Uh, but that's really you know, a, a technicality here. Uh, for, uh, for the purposes of this course, we don't really worry about it. But whenever you saw n minus 1 or k minus 1 in denominator of some standard deviation, um, you, 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 you shouldn't worry about it. And just know that it is sample standard deviation. You, you also had a question. Let me. I was going to ask about like, separating the data set. You did it with like, split into three even sections. Oh, yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way, right? Uh, it, here it is even. The only situation is you know, we may have a number that is not divisible by the number of folds. So we have 17 data points and three folds. As 17 doesn't divide yeah. by three, the last fold might be a bit smaller than the other ones. And, you know, all of the, it's like when you do that standard sort of 80 20 validation, what about the data? Like, what do you, how can you look at your data set and, and warrant like that you know, 80 split? Or how do you know it shouldn't be like 60 40? Yeah, yeah. One, one kind of rule of thumb is that depending on uh, how we are doing in terms of this, uh, we don't want this upper triangle, sorry, rectangle become, become too short. Yeah. So uh, if, if you have p predictors, let's say 10 predictors, this should not become less than 10. That's for certain. And uh, I mean, in, in practice, we always prefer cross-validation over validation. And in cross-validation, we don't make a decision about this, but instead we, make, um, we have a theoretical result that says number of folds um, is usually 5 or 10. Because um, it's just you know, something that is kind of proven in practice that with 5 folds or 10 folds, we can you know, shake up the data sufficiently uh, so that, uh, so that these, these, uh, these splits become uh, quite uncorrelated. That's the other thing, again, I mean, I mean, we're getting to more and more complicated statistical topics, but just to answer your questions. You know, this whole idea of averaging, we see it everywhere in machine learning, also in like bagged trees, bootstrap, bootstrap aggregated trees. Um, 
So the main idea is that when you average something, the standard deviation of that thing reduces because in standard deviation of average of something, there's an n in the denominator. And this, this decline in standard deviation is always larger when the data that we average over are uncorrelated. That's why you know, in, in bagged trees, we want to make those trees as uncorrelated as possible. Also here, with 5 or 10, uh, this allows us to have a relatively large number of folds without making the training here and training here become too correlated. So the extreme case of number of folds is n, is if we pick just one data point for validation and n minus 1 for training. But in that situation, the training from split 1 and training from split 2 will be highly correlated. Therefore, all these benefits that we got from aggregating and from this averaging in here um, will kind of uh, will be limited. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah. 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 Well, there one of those values is the number of folds. Yeah. So, so the thing is from. Um, let, let me just double check the equation. Can you tell me which slide is this? Sorry, let me see it there. I don't have access. Yeah. So here, uh, this is because we're using, this is not MSE. This is misclassification error, and I can explain it. So the thing is, um, this E double R is not averaged. Um, so, so what we discussed here was all based on regression, because we used MSE. All the examples were based on regression because we used MSE for the error. But we can have the same things. All of the same discussions are valid for classification task. In classification task, we measure the misclassification error, right? Um, which is the number of data points that we misclassify, number of actual images of cats that we classify as dogs or vice versa. That number is not a normalized measure. That number is 210, right? So that's why here we, have, we need to divide it by, let's say, number of predictions that we make which is like maybe 210 misclassification out of 1,000 images. There's one uh, denominator here. And then uh, th this thing become, becomes something comparable to MSE. And we can get the standard deviation of those MSE values. Yeah, that's why in, in the textbook you may see there's a formula where there are two denominators. All right, uh, let's, uh, yeah, let's uh, take a quick break, and then we will continue. <laughs> 